Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. The topic of this webinar is comparing the abilities of energy storage, PV, and other distributed energy resources to provide grid services. This webinar is a presentation of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. STAP is managed by the Clean Energy States Alliance or CESA for short, and supported by the U.S. Department of Energy and Sandia National Laboratories. We have two excellent guest speakers with us today, and we also have our host, uh, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a project director with CESA for the STAP project. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using a telephone or you can use your computer mic and speakers to join. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing your questions into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will save about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A. We've got a lot of attendees on the line, so we expect there to be a lot of questions. In order to make sure that we get to your question, type it in when you think of it, and don't wait until the very end to submit your question. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar, as well as all of our previous STAP webinars, on CESA's website at cesa.org backslash webinars. And we will also send you a follow-up email sometime this afternoon or tomorrow with a link to the webinar slides and recording so you can have access to those materials. So with that, I would like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd? Thank you, Samantha, and welcome everybody to another STAP webinar. And um, this one is going to be a bit longer than usual. We are going for an hour and a half today. We will try to answer as many questions as we can after the presentations are over. And I'm going to uh, give a little bit of background on CESA and the STAP project before I introduce our speakers for today. If you could advance the slides, please. So <clears throat> CESA uh, is Clean Energy States Alliance, and um, we are a nonprofit in Vermont. We conduct this program under contract with Sandia National Laboratories and funding with funding from US DOE Office of Electricity. So I'd like to thank our, uh, our program managers in Sandia, Dan Borneo, and DOE Office of Electricity, Dr. Emery Zhuk, for supporting our energy storage work. Next slide, please. And um, so STAP is a, an acronym that uh, stands for the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. And the partnership portion refers to the partnership between the federal and state components. So this is essentially a project where we try to uh, facilitate joint federal-state supported energy storage demonstration projects being deployed. And as you can see on the slide, uh, showing the map here, we have projects all over the country. Uh, we, uh, many of these are demonstration projects that are either uh, under construction or already built and commissioned. Some of these are also indicate state policy and program development around energy storage. Uh, in addition, we maintain an extensive listserv. We, uh, in addition to producing webinars, we also speak at conferences, we produce informational updates, uh, newsletters, and um, reports and related uh, types of materials. Um, and I will show you, uh, if you could advance the slide please, how to get on our mailing list. There's a green button there with a red circle around it that says sign up for this mailing list. So this is a screenshot from our STEP webpage. Go to this webpage click on that button and put yourself on the list and then you'll get uh, invitations to future webinars and other events, uh, notices of publications and so forth. Also on the left hand menu there you'll see there's a red arrow pointing to a little uh, green menu item that's 
called STAP webinars. That's where we archive these. So in answer to the question, I always get uh, multiple times, yes, the webinar will be made available following the conclusion of the broadcast in our archives so that you can review it, you can email links to it to all your friends and colleagues and so forth. Next slide, please. So uh, having said all that, I'm happy to now introduce our panelists for today. We have David Rosewater and Dr. Sup Sutipta Chakraborty. Um, I'm going to introduce them in the uh, order in which they're going to begin speaking. We're going to have David Rosewater kick off the presentation. He's a senior member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories, where he researches how energy storage devices and systems can help to make the future grid more efficient, sustainable, and resilient. He previously worked for the Idaho National Laboratory for three years developing advanced spectral impedance measurement techniques for hydrogen vehicles cells before moving to the stationary energy storage sector in 2011. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Montana Technology uh, at the University of Montana and he's currently pursuing a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we also have Dr. Sudipta Chakraborty, a principal electrical engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, in Golden, Colorado. His recent research is focused on power electronics and grid integration of renewable and distributed energy resources to the electric grid, and he's also chairing the IEEE 1547.1 full revision working group. So, uh, I'm, if you could go to the uh, first presentation slide. Uh, I just want to re reiterate a couple of things before we start. One is um, <clears throat> please do send in whatever questions you may have as you, they uh, occur to you. We have a pretty large number of attendees, um, 279 at this point as I'm looking at my screen here. So. Um, don't wait till the end of the presentations to ask your question. We'll do our best. We rarely get to all of them, but we do try. And uh, the second thing I want to say is just to, to remind everyone, it's an hour and a half webinar, and we will, uh, <clears throat> again, do our best to set aside a good portion of time toward the end for questions. So with that, I will pass the microphone to David Rosewater. Thank you, Todd. Um, as Todd mentioned, my name is David Rosewater. Uh, I am a researcher at the Sandia National Laboratories. And today, uh, myself and my, and my colleague, Sadeep Dejarkarvorti, will be talking about comparing the abilities of energy storage, PV, and other distributed energy resources to provide grid services. And I'm really excited to talk to you today because this research represents the very starts of a, of a slight paradigm move towards uh, a different way of looking at how DER are providing grid services and, and how they can really be compared on a level, level playing field. So I have a short introduction to talk about, uh, just a second. I have a short introduction uh, to go through uh, that, that really uh, outlines the motivation behind this uh, work uh, and, and the, uh, goes over the, the, the changes that are happening to the grid in real time that are really driving some of these changes in, in our perspectives on how we think about renewable energy and distributed energy resources. Uh, in, I want to also introduce the Grid Modernization Laboratory Consortium project that is focused on, uh, on really forward-looking research uh, on this, this topic. And then I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Sadipta, who is going to cover photovoltaic system device models. Um, device models are a really important part of how we look at different technologies. And so uh, he's going to cover photovoltaic systems, uh, and he's then going to pass it back to me, and I'm going to cover uh, battery systems. Uh, the reason why we're pairing these two together is because they are uh, very uh, uh, cell, uh, supportive technologies for the grid that together they can supply uh, potentially uh, more services than they do apart. And so pairing them together, uh, because they are similar, uh, that we can kind of contrast similar uh, devices uh, so we can 
help you get, give you a perspective on, on how to think about DER uh, as the grid is changing. Our overarching goal for this, this webinar is that at the end of it, you will have a, a different way of thinking about uh, grid services and, uh, the, diff and the, the unique capabilities of various devices to be able to supply those services on the grid. With that, I'll jump, jump right into it. One of the primary drivers behind uh, the changing electric grid is the changing mix of generation on the grid. Uh, the figure below uh, is from the Energy Information Administration, uh, and, it, and it projects, this is the 2017 projections for what uh, resources are going to be making up our electric supply in the coming years. And essentially the takeaway from this is, is whether or not the, the high-level policy goals uh, are, or whatever direction high-level policy is, is taking, the, the fundamentals of the cost reductions in renewable energy is really driving a, a fundamental change in this makeup, and that the role of renewable energy is going to be expanding over the next 20, 30 years uh, at a very fast rate. And this will require uh, a new way of thinking about uh, uh, distributed generation. Historically, conventional generators uh, have supplied many different services to the grid other than wholesale energy. Uh, they, are, they are paid for uh, through their, their export of wholesale energy uh, in the wholesale energy markets. Uh, but they also supply uh, many different, uh, different services, uh, such as peak supply, inertia, voltage management, capacity, frequency regulation, spinning reserve, and ramping. And these are just a, a few of the, of the services that these uh, conventional generators uh, supply, and yet the payment for them is, is really bundled into that wholesale energy, except in a few locations uh, and, and markets. This is kind of the historical perspective. Uh, when renewable generators come into this, this, uh, this uh, area, uh, they're presently really only supplied uh, really only supplying one resource, and that is wholesale energy. This is because uh, to drive down costs and, and uh, for other reasons, it's really important that these devices produce as much energy as the environment gives them. So a wind resource would produce uh, as much wind, as much electrical power as the wind provides to it, or a solar plant would produce as much power as the sun provides to it. Um, this, is, this is historically how it's done, but it means that the amount of production is, is stochastic and it is based only on that, that supply. Now this is changing a little bit. Um, services are, are beginning to be decoupled, and we see this in, in many different locations uh, in, in uh, m uh, how markets are being set up for ancillary services, uh, and, and many exist uh, Many markets already existed for these ancillary services, but the le playing field is being leveled so that DER can, uh, can enter into those markets. Um, these include markets for FSA frequency regulation and PJM. Now, DER can supply these services, but they supply them very differently than conventional generators, and they supply them very differently between DER, between different types of DER. So uh, the, the fundamental question is how well do each of these devices supply this, these services? And are they effective as, as generators? And, and how do you really compare one to the other uh, effectively and on an even playing field? And, and this is made, is made especially difficult by the, the variety of technologies being used for these services. Everything from demand response, including residential uh, heating, ventilation, and air condi uh, conditioning, HVAC, um, or, or demand response with refrigerators, to very highly controllable battery and inverter systems. Um, there's a, a variety of extremely different physical technologies that are being enabled through smart grid communications 
to supply services on the grid, but fundamentally they supply them very differently, and it's very hard to compare them apples to apples. So that's where this, this project comes in. That's where we're re our research is trying to change things. Essentially what we've done, what the, the Grid Modernization Laboratory Consortium, or GMLC, uh, did was it, it broke up all of the different dev devices and all of the different grid services into, uh, into pieces and then uh, uh, took on that very, very large project as a team project uh, at all of the different national labs working in this area. So, so PNNL, NREL, Sandia National Laboratories, uh, Ames, Ornell, LBNL, INL, uh, alphabet soup on the side there of, of different national labs who are, are working on this problem, all now working together to solve a much bigger problem than we could separately. So uh, our approach to this is based on this, this, this cyclical curve here in the bottom corner, where fundamentally, the grid expresses its needs through certain incentives that reach devices that, that respond to those incentives. This is fundamental economic theory. The devices then deliver those services and the value that comes with those services back to the grid. So this cycle informs all of the, all of the research that we're, we're doing in this area. And our, our high-level goal is to make it very easy, or, or at least uh, uh, very fair, to compare different technologies supplying the same service and compare them on an even playing field. So our general framework, and I'll get back to that cycle here in a minute, and I want to go through all the different pieces of this, uh, this process. So the device is on the left-hand part of the screen, and the service will be, when it comes up, is it will be on the right-hand part of this screen. So we'll start over here at uh, the device itself and characterizing uh, exactly how it works. It's important to understand the nuances of how a building lighting system or a battery or an HVAC system works, and in exactly in, in understanding those nuances, we can build a model of it. So that's the device model end of things. On the on the grid service guide side of things, it's really important to characterize exactly what the requirements are from our grid grid service uh, grid service. Uh, this this is how the grid service communicates its needs through incentives to a device. So it's important that we characterize that very, very precisely. So we take uh, the, the expected conditions, such as if it's a very hot day and there's, there's a heavily loaded grid, um, and, and then we characterize exactly what the requirements are for the grid uh, to, to pass along through incentives to a device. The device model. It's a very important piece of this, and it is, it is built using the characterization uh, tests uh, and existing industry standards for, for how you uh, uh, express the performance of a device. Uh, and we, we wanted to be, develop a mathematical model that, that represents the, the nuances of the system's behavior. And essentially, this uh, is also based on the a standard set of assumptions for, for what you might expect a system would encounter if it was put into a, a field. The grid service uh, dispatches a fleet of what we're calling battery equivalent models. Now this I'll, I'll get into in the, the following slides, but essentially it's a simplified linearized model of a, a battery equivalent. Uh, and this is, this is important to understand because uh, Storage of energy fundamentally is the, the moving of energy usage or production from one time to another time. And so if you can abstract out the, the eccentricity, eccentricities of a specific technology, like HVAC, that you can, you can represent it mathematically using a battery. Uh, and if we can do that, then we can compare 
the, the abstracted version of an HVAC system with the abstracted version of, of a inverter-based system. So we have the grid service communicating with the battery equivalent model and the device model being built and we're using standard tests. Now the device model, which represents the physics of what's going on in the actual device, updates the parameters of the battery equivalent model, uh, which then uh, updates at each time step to communicate back and update the device model. And if this is done, this is simulated in, in a recursive way at each time step, at, at one second, at two seconds, at three seconds, at four seconds, all the way through uh, a, a time horizon, for example, one year's worth of, of representative data. And the output of that is the performance metrics. And essentially, we, we match these two together so that so that we can understand exactly how well these devices perform on, uh, compared to one another when providing the same grid service. So this is a complicated map, but I hope I spent enough time on it to really, really uh, inform you about how we approach this process logically and, and uh, methodically. So I was talking about the battery equivalent model, and I want to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, State of charge is something we think of when we think of batteries. As the, as the current energy stored in, for the grid service divided by the maximum potential uh, energy in that, that stored device. Uh, for example, a battery could be at 50% state of charge. Uh, we, we see this, this metric on our phone quite a bit. Well, well that same quantity can be, can be thought of for, say, air conditioners. The, the thermal mass in a building divided by the allowable temperature rise of that building can be used as this abstracted model for how much energy is currently stored in that demand response function. Similarly, of electric vehicles who plug it in at, say, 10 o'clock, you need it charged all the way to 100% by 6 o'clock, but you really don't care when and how the battery charges in that in that medium, you can abstract out a deferred charge divided by a energy uh, charging energy required as this metric for state of charge. And in this way, you can uh, you can you can take a step back and really look at these technologies on an even basis because whether or not you have 50% state of charge in a battery or 50% state of charge in a thousand air conditioners spread out over an area. It, it really doesn't matter to the grid service. And so uh, one, one of the quotes I, I really like to say with, with the advancement of, of this kind of thing is, is that wisdom is knowing what, is, what can be ignored. And if you can ignore the physics of the device itself, then there's a lot of power in being able to compare devices. Uh, uh, just a, uh, one more slide on the battery equivalent model. It has nameplate style parameters, things like capacity, maximum power, minimum power, ramp rate, charging efficiency, discharging efficiency, and these are abstracted quantities for, for how, they, uh, how the, the system is represented. Um, and again, this is modeling a, a fleet of identical devices, not an individual device. So this is not us sitting down and trying to model a refrigerator that is turning on or turning off. This is meant to be modeling 1,000 refrigerators, 10,000 refrigerators that are being coordinated using smart communications to really uh, uh, provide these services in bulk. Um, just to give a, one, a really concrete example of this, um, let's take uh, the peak supply service. So this, is, this uh, can supply benefits at many different points in the grid, uh, and essentially peak supply uh, say, for example, this is behind the meter. Uh, this is a commer commercial building of some sort that has a demand charge. And if they can reduce their maximum demand, their peak demand, over a period of a month or a year, then they can reduce that uh, demand charge in, on their bill and save them not, themselves money. Our approach for analyzing this service would be to analyze 
the, the daily peak loads for an entire year. Uh, they, this would, uh, we would start with some baseline demand reduction target, say 10%. Uh, and then we would make sure to skip all of the days that the load didn't come within 10%. And this is, this is what that would uh, essentially look like. We would go through each time step. We would start at the beginning and we would go through each time step and ask the battery equivalent model, can I supply this service? The battery equivalent model then responds, yes, I can supply this service, I can discharge and, and offset this load by this much. It then updates the, the device specific model, which then renew, uh, updates the parameters for the battery equivalent model and we step forward in time supplying the next service, and the, where the grid service asks, can you supply this one? And, and doing this, we've, met, we've managed to linearize a highly nonlinear uh, uh, physical process into something that the, the, the uh, service can essentially query on its capabilities at each time step. And we move through the entire year and uh, noting when, it, how, if the, the battery can supply this service, the battery equivalent model can supply this service, and then uh, if it can, then we increase the demand reduction target. So we move from 10% to, let's try to reduce it by 11%. And if it can do that, then we move to 12%. Uh, and so on and so on until it can't. And it, once we know that it can't, we step back and say, okay, one before that, that is the performance of this device fleet. And whether or not that's done at behind the meter or, or in front of the meter, um, there are many different places where this kind of service can be, can be applied. Say, for example, this, the, scales on, the scale on this side is in megawatts. So if this is done in aggreg by aggregating 1,000 uh, refrigerators, or if this is done by installing a large battery system, it doesn't really matter. That can be ignored. The point is, is that the, the service has certain requirements that the device can then supply. With that, I'm going to pass it off to Sadipta, who's going to talk more about a very specific device model. Now, this is, this is that underlying representation of the actual physics that's going on in the device. Uh, you can feel free to move the slide deck over. Uh, this is the underlying physics of the actual device, and from there, I'll, I'll let him take it away. Okay. Thank you, David. So this is Shudipta Chakraborty from National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, I am actually, our uh, NREL is in charge of the photovoltaic systems uh, part of this project, as well as some of the grid services like uh, uh, voltage regulation. So what I'm going to cover today is the how we are going to implement this uh, project methodology to this uh, for the photovoltaic systems. So, so again, just some recap of the primary objective. So what we are trying to do here, as David mentioned, so we are trying to, as a, for a device, we are trying to come up with the protocols for characterizing a device fleet performance. So it is very important to understand that a one single distributed device probably not going to uh, provide this type of grid services, megawatt scale thing. So, we need a fleet of services. So we are actually assuming whatever we are doing on a device can be translated into a big fleet. And also in the when we are doing these testing procedures, we have to make sure these are short term, so it can be doable. We don't want to run a one year or two year long test procedure to figure out a device uh, device's capability for the grid services. And then one of the important things, what we are what is the end goal? We are actually trying to come up with a recommended practice document for at least the initial phase of this project that will talk about what are the devices we are trying to get and how how we are characterizing those devices, what how we are translating those characterization to a grid service and with for different types of grid services. So we will be actually we already have a recommended practice document uh, like the initial chapters are already uploaded in a website and we can send you the link later. Uh, we expect you guys to review that and come up with your input so we, we know more details because we don't claim we know everything about all the devices. We are trying our best here to start something, but we'll appreciate your input. 
So, uh, and then the once we have those uh, device sleep performance determined, then we are actually looking into some standard drive cycles. So, when you are talking about a grid service such as frequency regulation or say uh, uh, like a spinning reserve, every, every all of those devices, for example, David was showing the peak load service, it has a drive cycle. So it has a, what I call by drive cycle is more like a time response of the power, active or reactive power that need to be uh, given by those devices to, uh, to provide that grid services. So we'll be utilizing some of those standard drive cycles. In some cases, we have to come up with a drive cycle if it is not present there. And then we'll be coming up also with some metrics where we can talk about the capability of devices, so we can compare, as David mentioned, compare different devices for different types, but compare them such that we can come up with some form of a comparison or some form of a level rating, maybe in very future in uh, when you have a certification type of thing, but that's, we are not looking into that yet. But once we have that, we at least can compare, like this one is better than the other device for certain particular type of grid service, things like that. And to do that, we have to come up with some standard model for devices with parameters were determined by the characterization procedure. Now, another important thing here, we don't want to add a bunch of new test procedure for this project. What we are trying to do here is to utilize as much as possible the already uh, available parameters, already available uh, uh, spe specification sheet and things like that. So we are trying to minimize that burden of additional testing. But as we will see, there may be some need at the end of the day, but we are trying to minimize that. So we are trying to use as much as possible from the available literature. Again, I don't want to spend too much time because David just covered this model uh, or this actually this general framework. But again, for what we are focusing here today, at least on my side, I am focusing here this device model piece. So how we are going to do a model, a PV device. Now, again, when I talk about model, model can be different types. It can be transient, steady state, quasi steady state, even dynamic, and all those different things. What we need for this project, again, this is a very early stage, but what we envision that we will need here is a quasi steady state type of model, where we'll be actually, this will be more like a power, like an input output, and more like a power output type of model. It's not going to be like a transient, uh, like a fault analysis type of model because for grid services purpose we need something that is more telling us what is the available active and reactive power at the end of the day. Now uh, what we are going to cover again today in my side uh, is that the device model for PV, the very initial ideas and how we can utilize the characterization test for get those device models. And then once we know those models, then we can feed it into a battery equivalent model, which we envision at this point will be similar for all the different classes of devices that uh, we've shown. For example, battery, energy storage, PV, uh, loads, and HVAC, and all those things. But the device model will be very different, because depending on the device characteristics, the model will be very different. So once we have this whole thing running, and the time step here, David gave an example of second time step, which may be useful for some of the applications. In some other application, we may need a different or faster time scale. That doesn't matter. In this case, we are actually creating this framework which should work from different time scale depending on what kind of services you are planning to provide. And as we move on to that, so this particular model, again, can be used for two different purposes, very distinct purposes. In our cases, we'll be using this for characterization of these devices. So we'll be actually using some common drive cycles and things like that. We are not trying to optimize those operations or how uh, one fleet of devices will work with another fleet of device and things like that. That is beyond the scope of this project because it will be a grid operator who will be uh, looking into some optimization scheme and come up with that uh, method. What we are providing to those grid operators are the uh, basically this framework where they can plug into their particular drive cycle, they can plug into their particular device and they can run through these methodologies and come up with a comparison between if they have to have a different mix of the types of devices, for example, PV versus storage versus vehicles and things like that. With that, I will jump into the PV inverter system. And some of those slides may be very uh, generic or high level because, because this is an energy storage, mainly specifically group. I just want to cover a little bit on the PV inverter system as well. Uh, so first of all, this is a very simplified, I would say a simplified structure of a PV inverter. So basically PV is a DC device, as all of you know. So we need a, 
way to convert that DC into AC. So this is uh, showing a, one way of doing that conversion. So this particular one has a DC to DC converter followed by a DC to AC converter which is called by inverter and then output filter and then it comes, it connects to the grid and it can also supply some local load. There are different varieties. Uh, for example, there can be single stage which means there is only one converter or there can be transformer at the output or there can be transformer at the DC to DC converter. So there are lots of uh, minute details but in our case we are just looking into this whole PV panel plus this converter as a single system which we call PV, that's why we said PV slash inverter system in this particular case when we are looking into these grid services. For different other applications we may have to look into different other ways of modeling the PV but again everything I'm talking here today is focused on this uh, grid services requirement. Next slide, so what are the standard controls and operations of the smart advanced PV inverters? So some of them are very like what you are seeing here in this slide, some of them are pretty new. Uh, they are not maybe a couple of years old and in some cases in US they are right now getting implemented. But still I think it is worth mentioning of all those new, because all the new inverters that you will be buying from like in next few years or maybe in from next six months to next one year will have almost all of those functions. So a basic function for a PV inverter is the deliver uh, real power. Typically it follows a maximum peak power. So it has a maximum peak power tracking. But you can also work that inverter outside that maximum peak power tracking when in a constant power control. Uh, some of those inverters, the uh, older ones, have voltage and frequency creep. That means if there is a grid and uh, frequency, uh, there is a grid voltage or frequency imbalance, the inverter will trip. With more and more penetration from renewable energy and high uh, and the distributed PV, we are actually looking into some of the additional functions to support the grid rather than just stripping off. So some of those are voltage and frequency right through that are currently being implemented in those uh, new inverters. And then also there are things called unintentional eye landing detection where you are actually detecting a grid fault and tripping means if there is a big grid fault whether there is no power uh, on the distribution circuit, then your inverter need to detect it and trip as soon as possible, typically within two seconds. There is grid synchronization requirement, obviously, when you are connecting back to the grid, you need to synchronize to the grid. And then there are some grid support functions that are being implemented nowadays in the inverter. For example, real power functions in such as like frequency watt, uh, volt watt, and again, I am not going to go into all those details of every function for the sake of the time, but this is kind of a snapshot that is coming from new interconnection standards such as revised IEEE 1547 which is currently under development. Uh, reactive power functions similarly are such as like fixed power factor, fixed reactive power, volt bar, watt bar and some other version of those. And then another important thing coming into all those new inverters, they have some form of communication. Most of them have a proprietary communication and some of them also have some standard communications. Uh, to talk to those inverters. Now how these inverters can provide grid services, for especially for the PV case, because for autonomous services, there are two types of services this inverter can provide. One is the autonomous service, for example, PV inverter system can provide very fast autonomous real power, such as inertial response, or reactive power, such as voltage regulation services. So time scale for such services can be very fast, because we have this fast inverter interface, so it can be very fast. That is more or less common and it will be, it is kind of getting implemented right now in some of the territories such as California and Hawaii, but it will get more and more uh, uh, common in all other United States, uh, like all other 50 states here very soon. The other one that we are looking into here is dispatch service. Now obviously PV is a non-dispatchable uh, system by definition because it depends on the primary source of energy which is uh, solar irradiance and the temperature. But as we are talking about a big fleet of devices, those non-dispatchability can be taken care of either by the geographical, uh, geographical diversity as well as we can have better ways of forecasting those PV radiance and temperature which can be utilized to provide some of the dispatch services to the grid using the PV. Now note that some of the variability of individual PV inverter will be mitigated again because of this large fleet as I mentioned just earlier. And again this is kind of seems little bit uh, 
new, but there are some efforts going on where uh, basically there was an enroll project where we are working with uh, Puerto Rico and we are utilizing a big PV inverter to support their voltage or their frequency regulation of their whole system. So it can be done, but we obviously need something such as forecasting and things to make it done as a dispatchable service. Now obviously there will be constraints. So when you are supplying uh, grid services from PV, one of the big concerns will be end user limit. So the PV may operate at reduced power level than MPP to provide grid service reducing the energy revenue. So again, if there is no compensation scheme, the owner may not opt to participate in such services. So one thing here, the important thing here is that in this particular project that you are listening today, we are actually looking into the characterization test procedures and how you compare those devices, but there are some parallel ongoing projects happening under this grid modernization a laboratory consortium where a group of uh, like a lab people as well as the stakeholders are looking into the providing the value, like how you can calculate the value, how you can uh, implement the policy. So those value and policy questions are not part of this project, but they are not uh, forgotten about. So we are looking into those into some other projects that is happening at the same time. There is also some dispatchability limit. As I mentioned, the dispatchability is as good as your forecasting will be, so there will be some forecasting accuracy limits there. And finally, there will be some equipment limits. For example, if you are running the PV system to provide the voltage regulation for the whole day, you may have some impact on the reliability of the PV system or the lifetime of the PV inverter itself because now you are uh, reaching the current limit of the thermal limit of those systems. So again, just to tell you this, that we are not neglecting those. So these are all part of this matrix that we are building for the PV and all other devices. So we are not just looking into the values, but we are also looking into the constraints and how we can address those constraints when you are comparing those devices. So some of the things that, uh, now what I'm going to change here a little bit and show how PV system, what are the important things that is needed for those PV inverter system to provide these grid services. Number one, what are the minimum control requirements are needed for providing grid services. And as you will see, most of them are already available for the PV inverter. So this is kind of reiterating what is available, but and I'm pretty sure same for same true for the storage inverter, but not all the devices are in the same board. So we are looking into all those devices as well. In, in PV's case, for providing this autonomous service, you basically have to have the capability to change output real and reactive power autonomously based on some local measurements, such as voltage and frequency. So you have to follow the preset set points or a preset curve. You have to have a time response, specific time response, because you cannot be too slow uh, than the time scale for a particular grid service. You have to have the command and communication to switch between different autonomous modes, and then you may have a command communication to di set different curves. For example, these are some sample curves. This is just for giving you an example if you're not familiar. So the left, the lower left one, this one is showing the volt bar curve. So basically, you are measuring the voltage at the terminal of your devices or some other remote point, and based on that voltage, you are injecting or absorbing reactive power to mitigate the voltage issue. And then the other one is showing the frequency watt curve where you are actually changing the output of your inverter to support the grid when there is a frequency issue. The frequency is beyond the uh, fre normal operating frequency. Again, these are some uh, example curves. No way this represents every possible uh, every possible ways of doing those curves, but this just gives you some idea how they will look like. For the control requirements for the dispatch services, so again, they should have the ability to control the real and reactive power, in this case, based on an externally communicated signal. So some control requirements will include the command to switch between different dispatch modes, command to set the real power or reactive power, and then the time response, means whenever you receive that signal and how your device works. Because obviously the communication means to come to that device may be uh, outside of the scope of this project, we can only tell what is the minimum requirements, but because the communication can be of different types, how a utility or a aggregator will send those set points to the devices can be depending on the architecture and communication. So the latencies and things for that part will be hard to characterize at this point. But we can tell, for example, for frequency regulation, you have to have your communication reach to your device within certain X seconds. And that we can we will be specifying from this project. Once we have all those different parameters and things, then we can actually characterize or we actually can come up with a PV inverter model. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time because 
Uh, this is kind of an eye chart. I just want to show that we are actually working on coming up with this PV in water uh, model. Now, some important thing here is that so the lower part of this is this MPV estimation. So basically, based on the forecasted temperature and irradiance, we'll coming up with the output power from the PV panel and then utilizing the inverter efficiency numbers available, we can calculate what is our maximum output power at a certain time instant. And then depending on what kind of modes, either it is an autonomous or a direct grid control mode, we actually gonna uh, change the, we'll have a number of lookup tables, number of equations inside this box where we'll actually calculate what is the power requirements, active and reactive power requirements at that time instant. And then obviously we have to make sure that, that we are not violating any limit. First of all, your P cannot be, like active power cannot be more than whatever available power. Your reactive power will be depending on your device rating and your KVA also depending on your device nameplate rating. So all the limitations we have to satisfy and once we satisfy those, if not, then there will be some, uh, like I would say some uh, limits has to be placed on those P and Q and based on those, will then go into a ramp rate, a ramp limit, which is basically telling if you're changing a step between say P1 to P2, can we jump there instantaneously or there will be multiple small steps to go from P1 to P2. This will depend on how big your jump is, but these are all came from our experience on inverter testing, so it is very common and you will see a result at the end of the slide that shows that it's not always a step change when you go from one power level to another power level, but sometimes it is a number of small step changes rather than a big step. And also, as I mentioned, the time response will be a very important thing when you are talking about those grid services. So in this case, the time response uh, will be implemented for those devices. So now different parameters. So for those models, so what do we need? So because we have to come up with the model, so what kind of parameters will be needed for those models? So first thing is the adopted parameters. So these are the parameters that are available from existing tests such as standardized industry tests or certification tests or sometimes it is from the manufacturer provided specification. These are some examples such as kilowatt rating, KVA rating, efficiency such as peak and CEC. In case of PV, we have the standard test condition, PV efficiency and the panel size. But then there are some other parameters that need to be characterized to come up with that model. Now, a disclaimer here, we are thinking of some of those Right now, as of today, there are not as much certification testing available for some of the advanced smart inverter, except the California uh, work with UL to develop UL 1741 SA, which actually looking into some of those advanced functions. So it's still not there, but once we have some of those done by a certification test body like UL, then we can get some of those parameters uh, also from the certification testing, such as uh, VAR capability modes, response time for the VAR, what modes, their response time, startup ramp rates, and things like that. Also, the conversion efficiency, even though we have the CEC efficiency and the peak efficiency from the certification, we have to have other ways to get the conversion efficiency, such as for a particular drive cycle or duty cycle, depending on what kind of grid services they are providing. This is showing an example test setup. So basically, we'll have a PV simulator or a PV, actual PV array connected to an inverter connected to a utility grid simulator, which is uh, you can create any voltage and frequency waveform. And then it will, it will, sometimes it may have a load connected in parallel. And then obviously it is not showing the communication here, but there will be communication talking to those inverters to change those set points and things like that. These are some snapshots or some pictures from our lab at uh, NREL Energy Systems Integration Facility where we have a capability up to 1.5 megawatt uh, PV simulator, one megawatt grid simulator, and load bank, so we can test. And we actually tested inverters up to one megawatt size in our lab. Uh, some of the examples, so once we have those parameters defined, so we can come up with our example test protocols. For example, this one is showing a test protocol for efficiency testing that has currently been done by UL and other uh, NRTLs, like a nationally recognized test laboratory when they certify the inverter. So this particular one is showing an efficiency testing, and this was taken from a report by Sandia recently published, and showing this is a little bit uh, different than a typical CC testing, because in a typical CC testing, you use only unity power factor, but then this particular one is looking into 0.9 power factor, a lead or lag, because all those new inverters will come up with those advanced functions. 
But disclaimer here again is that even though the CEC efficiency is available from manufacturer for the grid service purpose, we'll need to know the various efficiency number at various input and output conditions uh, for this grid services purpose. So furthermore, the impact of the advanced functions on efficiency will also need to be determined. Like when you have all those additional functions on top of those uh, basic operation of the inverter, how they are going to impact them. And my last slide to show an example of test protocols where parameters to be characterized. So this is showing an example of a voltage regulation function by volt power control. So basically, you are measuring the terminal voltage, and then based on that voltage, you are injecting or absorbing reactive power. So the first one on the left side is showing the time response. So basically, you are seeing how fast you can, suppose there is a change in your voltage, how fast your reactive power can respond. And as you can see, this one is showing a first order response. Based on our experience on testing more than probably 10, 15 different types of inverter, we saw varieties of type of response, for example, ramp type of response or first order. Even we saw second order in some of the inverters where it overshoots and then settles down to a value. And then also another important thing, so this is very important, like when you are talking about grid services, always grid service will have a time component, like when you are talking about a frequency regulation or voltage regulation, in this case a voltage regulation, how fast you can respond. And then the other thing is that how good you can respond, and which is shown here in the next slide, or next uh, figure here. So in this case, basically you are running the inverter and you are changing the voltage and you are measuring the output reactive power. And as you can see, like the the reactive power response with green curve is not a like a continuous line, but it has small steps. So that's what when you said in our model we need to have a ramp response, this is what I was mentioning. So you, you have a limitation how fast you can jump between one state to the another state. So with that, I think the main goal here again, we are trying to utilize all those test protocols and we are developing whatever is missing, but at the end of the day our goal is to come up with that PV inverter model that can satisfy the need for these uh, grid services, uh, need for the grid services and utilize for finding out what are the grid services capabilities uh, we can get from the PV devices. With that, I will actually hand it over back to David. So, Right, well thanks Sudeepta. Uh, <clears throat> as I get control of the, the thing here, I think I'll, I'll ha I have control of it now. Um, Thank you for that. The I want to come back again to the the overarching uh, goal of this this work uh, and how these device models fit into it. Uh, the The overall goal is to compare how each device class uh, is able to supply different grid services, and uh, each each device model represents the physics behind what is actually going on in the device. Um, and, and we're trying to abstract out that physics to be able to, to understand uh, just how it supplies the service. Um, so, so with that explanation of PV devices uh, and, and how the physics behind the PV device works, so exactly what control loops are going on, uh, how it tracks the maximum power point of the PV panel, um, that, that physics is really important to understand through uh, uh, because that influences how the, the restrictions of how the battery equivalent model can supply services, and how you how you dive in and, and get at those behaviors, get at that physics is through testing. Uh, and there are a lot of available tests out there, uh, and and it, we can use those where when available. But then we also have to run a few tests uh, to to characterize behaviors that don't necessarily appear in those tests. And, and I'll, I'll kind of match that same uh, arc for how we're characterizing the, the battery inverted device model um, for, for understanding the physics behind it so that we can represent it to the battery equivalent model. So uh, here we go. Um, essentially, uh, I want to introduce kind of what uh, I'm talking about here because uh, battery and inverter systems are slightly different, are, are a subcategory of energy storage systems in general, uh, which this, this webinar series have, has covered several times. Uh, battery inverter systems are, are uh, electrochemical energy storage devices that are installed at very di uh, various different points in the electric grid 
all the way from bulk storage up at the transmission system down to distributed storage at uh, substations to uh, behind the meter storage in commercial locations and, res uh, and residential locations. Uh, right now, I'm not necessarily talking about vehicle to grid or thermal storage, uh, those, though those are device classes that we are considering in the overall project. Uh, but they have very different physics behind them and different requirements, so, so they're being looked at a little, little bit differently. Uh, uh, just to give some, in, some types, there are many different battery types, sodium sulfur, flow batteries, lead acid batteries, advanced carbon uh, lead acid batteries, uh, and, and lithium ion is, is one of the most, more prevalent ones. I just wanted to list a few examples here to, to show you what I'm, what I'm referring to. Uh, but these are mostly bulk storage. I want to also make it clear that I'm including in this aggregated, uh, very small storage. So residential storage wouldn't be able to supply much, uh, much in the way of grid services. But an aggregator can take a few hundred or thousand of them and, and pu pull them together into a, a larger asset that responds as a unit. So some standard device assumptions uh, here. Um, there's uh, each battery, just to further clarify uh, what, we're, what we're referring to, each battery and inverter device is composed of the battery itself, uh, a uh, bidirectional inverter that can both charge and discharge from the grid, uh, and a device controller that maintains internal limits. How you control that device uh, there are many different ways to control that device, including automated and, and manual control options. But the one I'm going to, to refer to specifically to, to emphasize the, the behavior of how it actually works is this manual control, power control with battery limits. And this is the idea that you set battery limits based on current voltage and temperature, and then attempt to achieve an AC power set point within those limits. If you reach those limits before reaching the AC power set point, the AC power uh, stops at, at that limit. So if you say wanted to supply 20 kilowatts to the grid, uh, but had a high voltage limit of 48 volts, then the battery, the the uh, the I'm sorry, a low voltage limit of say 48 volts then the system would discharge the battery and try to achieve 20 kilo, uh, kilowatts. But if it, only, if it hit that 48 volts at, say, 10 kilowatts, then it would stop there. So this is important to understanding how the actual battery responds to requests from the grid. And so, so this is the, these are the kinds of parameters that would be passed to a battery equivalent model where you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily pass voltage or current or any of these, these, uh, these, sub, these, these state variables. You would just pass, well, we can supply 10 kilowatts. As an as a aggregated set of systems, we can supply 10 kilowatts uh, to, to the battery equivalent model. So that's important to understand, but uh, automated control uh, can be done as either a sequence of manual control actions so that's, say, example, a schedule using time of discharge at 10 o'clock and discharge at 6 o'clock or uh, charge at 6.01 and discharge at 6.02, or a sequence where you uh, have specific uh, transition require, uh, uh, limits where, where you uh, move from one manual control action to the other based on a specific, uh, uh, specific uh, uh, automated services. Uh, or, uh, obviously, there are, are many different services that are based on automated functions. Uh, Sadiq to covered many of them, including volt far or frequency watt, that, that don't have this scheduling, uh, but they do have an automated response based uh, where they issue a manual control, such as power control, uh, based on some externally measured or received uh, value, such as voltage or, or frequency. So, Again, this is a model-based approach, so we're going to see, uh, understand what the input is, uh, how that's processed by the different uh, by the battery model, and how that achieves an output. Essentially, 
the, the input variables are things like requested power, power and uh, environmental temperature. Also, I mentioned other things like voltage or frequency could be uh, used as inputs for this model. Um, the internal states, these are things that aren't necessarily del uh, delivered to uh, the battery equivalent model, but they are tracked uh, as part of how the device, uh, uh, how the internal uh, device model calculates what its limits are. And then the output, these are things like power deli actually delivered to the, the service, uh, the efficiency of operation, and the uh, and any life acceleration factors, and I'll get that get to those at one of the, the last slides. Uh, also, it'd be nice to have uh, an operational cost associated with those life uh, acceleration factors, but th that isn't really a requirement of of the output. So the model parameters. Uh, so these are all the different variables associated with it. The model parameters describe how these different variables are related to one another. They are the behaviors of how the system actually responds to external stimulus. So to derive those model parameters, there are a host of, of existing test protocols out there for, uh, for testing battery systems. Uh, I've included several here for your reference, but I won't really go through them for, for time purposes. Uh, but they, they include protocols and test standards uh, for, for evaluating different parts of of battery systems. Now, it's important to be able to characterize these different internal parameters. Uh, and, and a really important overarching design goal for our project is to not use any parameters, uh, not, not impose too much additional work on uh, manufacturers for, for running additional tests uh, to characterize these parameters. So we're going to use as much as is available in the uh, in the existing literature for this. And essentially, the nice thing about this is that if you if all of the tests uh, available in the, that last side slide have already been run, then you can pretty much build this this model from those those data. Uh, and no additional tests need to be run uh, if you've done all that testing. But if you haven't, uh, we are, are we have put together an, uh, a more condensed version of those tests uh, that can be accomplished more quickly and efficiently uh, if you want to run this just for deriving a model. Uh, this is the Energy Storage Pulsed Power Characterization Test, or ESPPC. Uh, it's a combination of tests from the references above and offers a very efficient way of deriving model, battery model parameters. Of course, no matter how you select parameters, it's, it's important that you know how accurate your model is. And so another important metric of this is going to be to run the model and the system on the same duty cycle and derive how accurately the model uh, uh, forecasts uh, the system's behavior. So first we will cover the, the characterization apparatus, how we actually set the devices up to, to run these tests. Essentially, in the laboratory, we set up uh, the utility simulator and the, the battery and inverter system uh, in the lab. And then we, we place measurement both between the battery and inverter and between the inverter and the grid. And we time synchronize that data acquisition system with a utility management simulator that, that translates and sends commands to the inverter for, for, this, for the charge and discharge, for the power command with, with battery limits. Uh, manual control mode. Uh, this is how we set it up in the lab, and it's important to get uh, temperature, voltage, and current measurements from both the battery and the inverter because that's really important for understanding the physics of what's actually going on. Okay, so I won't go through each step of the energy storage pulse power uh, characterization profile uh, in detail here, but I wanted to list them out uh, just so that you have this as, as reference. It's much easier to explain with the figure uh, on the next slide. So essentially, we can walk through it here. We start here at time zero, and we fully discharge the system down to zero state of charge before then waiting an hour for the battery, for the battery to reach a, a thermal equilibrium to cool back down, and then we charge it back up again to 100% state of charge. 
This is, at this point, we let the battery come back down in temperature again. Now, we run tests at each state of charge uh, from 90% to 0%, 90% to 10%, uh, and then have a, uh, a conditioning side on each side. So these are nine tests run from here to here. What well, essentially they, they uh, amount to, <coughs> excuse me, is a discharge by 10% state of charge at a low rate, a rest period to determine to let the batteries cool back to a nominal temperature, and then a series of charge and discharge pulse pulses. I'll go over exactly what that looks like on the next slide. But essentially what this does is it is it takes a snapshot of the device's maximum performance at that state of charge. Essentially the the reason for this is that the battery's behavior is highly nonlinear depending on which state of charge you're at. And so being able to capture its performance at each state of charge helps you develop a very precise model for battery behavior. So we run through this at 90%, 80%, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. What, that, what these, these pulse tests look like are a discharge pulse, followed by a short rest, followed by a charge pulse, followed by a short rest, and then another discharge pulse at a, at a steadily decreasing uh, power levels. Now, uh, we ch we've chosen 10, 75, 50, 30, 20, and 10 specifically to match up with the efficiency characterization that Sadiq Dupla presented in his, in his slide on inverter efficiency parameterization. Essentially what this does uh, is it allows us to verify and, and build a, a fish, uh, an inverter conversion efficiency model based on uh, the, the specific state of charge that this test is run at. Uh, essentially, the inverter efficiency is dependent on DC voltage, so as the battery is discharged from full to empty, you can see that the, the inverters become slightly less efficient, and we can incorporate that into our model using this test. So high level, we can run this test on a battery, and the electrical model, electrical parameters measured out of the model, out of the device itself, help build the electrical model, whereas the thermal properties measured out of the battery help develop a thermal model. Uh, the thermal model is very important for what I'll just talk about next, which is uh, the, the life acceleration factors. Uh, oh, first, um, I want to make sure to mention that it's important to verify how accurate your model is. So once you have a state of charge and a, and a thermal temperature model, that you then run it on a uh, a, tr a duty cycle that is very close to what you expect it to undergo in actual real-world operation to verify exactly how accurate your model is. Here's an example of that. This is a profi profile for frequency regulation that's supplied from one of the references I, I listed above. Uh, it essentially provides a charge and discharge schedule for a battery system, uh, and essentially you run the actual device on this profile, right next to the model on this profile, and you you this is to test how accurate your model is at predicting uh, system state of charge and temperature. Once you've done that, now I'll get into the uh, equipment impact metrics. Uh, it, for all of these devices, whether it's a battery, an HVAC system, or potentially, as as Sadiq mentioned. It's, it's possible there's some age uh, acceleration factors that these advanced functions uh, have on inverters uh, that using them in a different way perhaps could accelerate how quickly they are, are degrading. Uh, and as batteries age, one of the aging mechanisms is a growth in internal impedance or, or resistance. Uh, this, is, this is the batteries becoming more resistive, more electrically resistive over time, and that eats up a little bit of power and that generates a little bit more heat, uh, and, and so it's, a, it's a, one of the ways that batteries degrade over time, uh, and uh, uh, generally each manufacturer will have a very precise model for how this, this uh, age uh, grow, this, this impedance grows over time. They'll have a calibrated model associated with uh, uh, that 
the exact mechanisms for that behavior. But because those are usually proprietary and we don't have access to those, uh, we do have a couple of acceleration factors uh, to use from one of the references. And that is calendar life acceleration factor and cycle life acceleration factor. Now it's important to note that calendar life acceleration uh, is mostly temperature dependent. And this is essentially a exponential model based on a reference temperature where the batteries are normally, normally happiest uh, and the actual temperature measured. Uh, now this is where those, those uh, the thermal model from above becomes important because you can average over a day or over a month how, what the average uh, temperature was uh, and you can, you can plug that, those, the, that time series temperature into this equation and get an average uh, acceleration factor for calendar life. And this can help you predict how quickly your battery is aging. Similarly, for cycle life, uh, you, can, you can plug it into this model, which is based on both power and temperature, uh, for how quickly the, the cycle life is being accelerated. Um, now, this is one way of doing it. Uh, we're, we're hoping to, to work with battery manufacturers to, to refine this and, and improve this a little bit. In summary, I want to cover, uh, just summarize the, the whole of what you've, you've heard in the webinar today, and then we'll have time, plenty of time for questions. Uh, as the resource mix of the grid is changing, uh, the emergence of distributed energy resources as, as valuable resources for supplying services uh, are, are going to be needed to be utilized to be able to maintain the reliability and cost of energy on, on the electric grid. Um, the value that these DR can provide depends greatly on, on the physics of the underlying model, uh, on the physics of the underlying devices, and it's, it's through testing and characterization that we, we then develop that model. And the performance can then be assessed fairly and equitably by a combination of this characterization we've been discussing and the modeling and simulation we discussed in the first part, uh, and, and through that, through that, that iterative simulation process uh, for all of these different devices, we can compare how well they perform each of these services on a, on a fair and equitable basis. Again, it comes back to this, this loop uh, of expressing and delivering, uh, expressing needs and delivering services. The approach can, uh, it's also important to quantify our accuracy so that we can propagate that accuracy to our, our prediction of performance uh, so, so that it becomes a more stochastic value where we, this is how accurate we think we are rather than just a, a single number uh, for performance. As Sadiq mentioned, uh, there is a, available for your review a draft recommended practice uh, just chapters one and two are available right now at the following link. Uh, this is something we're, we're trying to work very closely with industry on, and so any feedback you have on this, please go out and read it. Uh, it's, it's some draft language, but it's, but it's really good. We worked really hard on it. So, so really, I encourage you to go out and, and download it and read it uh, and send us any comments you might have. Uh, and last but not least, I wanted to uh, extend an invitation uh, to attend uh, a workshop we're holding next week. Obviously, it's very short notice, so unless you're already in Atlanta, it's probably not going to be uh, feasible for you to come. But just to let you know, we are holding a workshop with, uh, with uh, trying to engage industry more closely uh, on discussing this recommended practice and our research in general. Uh, with that, I think I'll conclude, and uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. I was really glad to, to be, with here, here, be with you here today. Okay, well, thanks very much, David and Sudipta, for uh, your presentations. We have a good number of questions, about 15 minutes, uh, so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, just before I, I, I go to the questions, give, give, us, give us a sort of an idea what 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 are the next steps you know, like what, what what's the glide path you know at what point does this become a uh, 
you know, a, a commercially available or publicly available um, product or or service. So the, the this is a three-year funded GMLC project. Um, with so we are we are going at this in stages. Chapters one and two are available right now for review uh, and comment. Uh, the next step is to to publish the uh, chapters three and four, I think, which are, are our grid device models and our grid service models. Uh, once those are, are out there for public review and comment, we essentially take that comment, uh, update those sections, and, and move to the testing phase, where we actually sit down in our laboratories and try to, try to run what uh, tests we've, we've derived to develop the device models. Uh, and, and we basically try to apply it to, to do a shakedown cruise for exactly how well it does what we want it to do. Um, that's going to be happening over, over the next year, from, from April to March of 2018, uh, in which we move on to phase three, which is really just trying to, trying to move this to either uh, an IEEE body or uh, really uh, upping our, our industry engagement to try, to try to get this out there and used in the, in the industry. Okay, so somebody is, uh, this is uh, going to our questions here. Somebody wants to know what software was used to model the general framework. Uh, this is Shudip here. So at our side, we, we have the conceptual, the general framework on my head will be modeled in something similar to MATLAB type of like a, uh, more like a uh, program language. It can be modeled in other things. I was thinking on our side, we'll be utilizing MATLAB for the initial take on the PV model. Uh, I would second second that something, uh, an engineering or, or just a programming language for modeling it on, on our end. Um, I will mention that uh, it is being passed between many different labs and uh, there isn't consensus on exactly what what programming software tool to use, so, so that is something that each lab can decide for themselves. Okay, great. Uh, there's somebody who, who asked whether the battery equivalent approach works for devices that can provide multiple services. In other words, uh, if the battery can provide both peak load reduction and ancillary services, uh, or is that, you know, is, this, is it able to handle that or are you assuming that only one service is provided at, at a time. Okay, uh, maybe I'll take it first. So, uh, yes, that's a very good point. And because, again, we are starting almost from uh, basic of the concept. So we are starting here at this point, one service at a time. But that doesn't mean that somebody can run a complex model. Like the model will be able to provide all those different functions. Now. When we are characterizing a device, we'll characterize it for a certain service. Otherwise, it gets much more messy, like when you are talking about one device, multiple service, and then multiple types of devices. So for the characterization sake, we'll be using one device, one service. Right. Uh, I think I'd second that and say our first step is to model a homogeneous fleet I mean, of identical devices uh, providing one service. Um, Obviously, that's not the only way to do things. You can have a non-homogeneous fleet of, of a bunch of different types of, of devices providing a host of different services. And that, that is probably the way it will actually be used in industry. But if you're trying to isolate variables, it's important to just, just kind of look at one thing at a time. And, and that's, that's what we're going to start with. OK, great. Uh, this is a question that is uh, specifically referencing um, page eight, I guess what they mean by that is, is maybe slide eight. Uh, the person says the PV system should have the ability to change output uh, real and or reactive power autonomously, but it needs to be allowed, coordinated, and or communicated by the EDC, which I guess would be the utility. How much research has been done on this aspect of the work? Uh, at this point, again, this is I think I was trying to clear it up, but 
we are not developing an operational test guide. Like we are not telling how to operate or how you mix those different devices, how you provide that thing. So what we are coming up is that if inverter and PV system from A, how compare how it compares with the inverter PV system B and inverter PV system C and things like that. And also other devices like battery A, battery B, uh, vehicle A, B, etc. So we are not looking into that operational aspect, but in, at this, in this project, that's what I want to clarify in this project, but there are several other projects happening around in national labs and also in the industry where people are looking into distributed controls, distributed controls and optimization of those devices, how you're going to operate them in coordinated fashion. So those are happening, but not in part of this project. So um, I'll, I'll only add to that. Uh, that's very, very true. But the I, I think what you're what's being referred to perhaps is an energy dispatch coordinator, um, and that gets to the concept of of an aggregator. This is a a, a legal entity, some or a, a company that contracts with a fleet of distributed assets, whether they're, they're demand response or PV or energy storage, and and pulls all of that capability into them and basically then contracts with the utility to respond to some aggregated service. So the utility sends them a command and they distribute that out to whatever assets they happen to have available at the time. And it's a level, uh, it's, it's this abstraction again, and, and that is we are tackling that to some degree in that we are assuming that it's a, a fleet of devices, but we aren't imposing any, any specific requirements or, uh, uh, or, or testing standards or anything on that that entity on that aggregator. And, and just to add there also, like, again, at the end of the day, this project will be doing a characterization test, a certification test, type of something like that, where you will be getting a uh, some form of level rating or something at the form for your PV inverter. So as a, uh, what you call the energy aggregator, when the aggregator will utilize those devices where they have those models, they can always change that uh, the drive cycle or change the device parameters and then they can run that optimization routine or a optimization schedule and then they will dispatch those devices based on that optimization. Okay, great. Uh, somebody is asking whether you ranked systems on the basis of IRR, in other words, uh, internal rate of return. It, what system provides best bang for the buck, or where's the low-hanging fruit? Is that some, anything that's at this point being considered? So our work is going to be very helpful for that kind of calculation, but we are not doing it for you. So it, uh, uh, we are going to have a, a way to compare, uh, say, aggregated air conditioners with battery systems on an even playing field for how well they supply grid services. But we are not going to then say uh, HVACs cost uh, this much, cost $1 million, whereas a battery will cost $8 million, uh, and, and therefore you should go with the air conditioners. We're not going to go to that. The, yeah, the market will handle those aspects of it, but the, the comparison on an even technical physics-based basis, that's what we're trying to tackle. Yep, and exactly, and to add that, that rate of return is always depend on the conditions. Like if if a different, it is almost impossible to compare one even in one location to the other location, geographic and other locations, depending on their resources and things like that. So we are more focusing on the technical side of those, how we can compare technical parameters between those things. Okay, great. Uh, there's a question here about battery degradation, uh, be, uh, whether, well, the question is, is battery degradation similar for all battery chemistries? But I, I think that I'm going to interpret that as meaning, are you using similar assumptions about battery degradation for all battery chemistries? Very good question. Very good question. So so the a couple of slides back, I, I went through... Uh, a calendar life acceleration factor and a cycle life acceleration factor. Uh, this makes a lot of assumptions about how that battery uh, degrades over time. And, and ideally, you'd use a calibrated model for a specific chemistry that has gone through a large, lar uh, a, a large uh, sample 
uh, testing regimen for developing a uh, and verifying life. Um, now this is going to be different for different ty cell types and battery types. Uh, and it's, I mean, I only factored in power and temperature, but there are many factors that that uh, go into that life acceleration factor for specific devices. Um, what we offered is is kind of one way of doing it, one way to look at it. Uh, it's kind of a first approximation, perhaps. But uh, yes, here's here's the slide with it with that where that goes. Here's. I mean, maybe a first approximation, but obviously if you have a, a specific um, chemistry that you're looking at, you would go, you would uh, do some research and, and figure out the uh, life acceleration factors for that de device. Um, or you would work with a specific manufacturer to say, okay, what is your life, life acceleration factor? And you would, you would use that in your model. Now, a lot of times battery manufacturers would not would be pretty reticent to supplying that because that's that's some of their secret sauce. Um, so it, it's not necessarily something you would have access to. Uh, where that is the case, I would uh, almost suggest not using it. But to, to have a first approximation, this is something that was provided in uh, reference four, which is uh, a vehicle battery stand. Uh, basically test manual for life verification. Um, and so, so without a calibrated model, this one's pretty good. Okay, great. Somebody wants to know if there's currently any guideline, standard, or regulation specifying ramp rate limits for residential and wholesale PV and battery energy storage systems. That might be a little outside the scope of this. Yeah, well, since there are, like again, not for the grid services purpose, as far as I know, there are some interconnection requirements such as California Rule 21 that has some uh, ramp rate limit for uh, for starting up as well as in a change in power type of thing. Uh, IEEE 1547, also another interconnection standard currently, currently getting revised, so it has some uh, some limit from those, but I don't know if there is anything available for a grid services respect, at least for PV. Uh, same for same for batteries. It's it's pretty much however the the designer of the device wants to do it. Um, yeah, there, that might be different internationally, but I'm not aware of any in the in the states. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Samantha, if we we have a couple of people asking to see the uh, the link again for where to find the draft recommended practice report. If we could put that back up so people can do a screenshot or or jot that down. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we're we're about out of time here. I want to thank our Presenters, I want to let people know, again, there's been several requests. Yes, the webinar will be archived at, a, at the CISA website um, in our webinar archives in the STAP project portion of the site and uh, should be up fairly soon, you know, within a day or two. Um, if not sooner, and it will be available both in full audio and visual format as well as as a slide deck that you can download. And uh, so I want to thank our presenters very much, David Rosewater and Sudipta Chakraborty, and also uh, thank everybody who attended. We have a number of upcoming webinars that are not necessarily STAP webinars, but they are related, and there we go, they're on the screen right now, uh, related topics that you may find to be of interest, and we welcome you to attend uh, any or all of them as they're all free. Samantha, do you have anything else you need to say before we close out? Um, I just want to alert people to the web address on their screen, which is csed.org backslash webinars. That's where they can find more information about all of the webinars posted on the screen. Okay, great. All right.
Um, thanks very much. If anybody didn't get that link, uh, where to download the um, the uh, the draft report, you can certainly email me. Uh, there it is again. Very good. But if you don't get it or you can't get it right now because you're you know on the highway or something, <laughs> watching this on your cell phone, uh, I hope not. But if that's the case, um, just uh, sh shoot us an email and we'll be happy to send you the link. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.